Alright everyone, please make sure that you um, have found this passage at the end of chapter 3. Um, the, the words to look out for is standing alone in, um, in at the end of, near the end of the chapter is Simon was not in the bathing pool as they had expected. So remember what has just happened here is um, Ralph and Jack um, had their disagreement where Ralph is talking about the importance of houses um, and, and building the huts and Jack is talking about how hunting makes him feel and how he's becoming almost addicted to hunting. Um, and then um, now we have Simon who has kind of wandered off. Remember Simon was the one person in the choir who tried to help build huts instead of going off and hunting. So let's start with, let's hear about Simon. This is a very description heavy passage which is one of the reasons I chose it. Um, because there's a lot in these description-heavy passages besides really interesting visual cues. Simon was not in the bathing pool as they had expected. When the other two had trotted down the beach to look back at the mountain, he had followed them for a few yards and then stopped. He stood frowning down at a pile of sand on the beach where somebody had been trying to build a little house or hut. Let's talk about that in a second. Then he turned his back on this and walked into the forest with the air of purpose. He was a small, skinny boy, his chin pointed, and his eyes so bright they had deceived Ralph into thinking him delightfully gay and wicked. The coarse mop of black hair was long and swung down, almost concealing a low, broad forehead. He bore the remains of shorts, and his feet were bare like Jack's. Always darkish in color, Simon was burned by the sun to a deep tan that glistened with sweat. Okay, so we've got a couple of interesting things. He's frowning down at a pile of sand on the beach where someone's been trying to build a little house or hut. Um, and then, you know, we have a question there. What's he frowning about? Um, the fact that it's a house or hut I think is pretty important. Clearly, he's, cho he's decided that building huts is important because he stuck around and tried to help Ralph. Um, but if someone was building um, a little house on the, on the sand, I'm going to assume that's like a little sand castle that someone was building. So is he thinking, oh, look, here they are playing again. They're playing at building houses while they're not actually building them. So this idea, our theme of games versus work. Or is he thinking about little ones and, you know, maybe we need to take better care of them. Um, is he thinking about destruction because there's a pile and nothing's actually been built? What is he really thinking about? We don't know. Um, and let's look at his physical characteristic. His eyes so bright. Well, okay, we've got one way to interpret bright eyes would be delightfully wicked or, um, you know, someone who teases. Um, but also think about what does bright eyes mean? The eyes are, we always think about the eyes are the windows to the soul. So, Maybe these bright eyes suggest intelligence, the ability to see things um, metaphorically that other people don't see. He can perceive things that others can't. Okay. And then finally, this, he bore the remains of the shorts. He, he, he looks, you know, outside he looks like Jack always darkest in color, Simon was burned by the sun to a deep tan that glistened. So he almost glows. He's got a glowing quality about him with his bright eyes and his glistening skin, um, right? He picked his way up the scar, past the great rock where Ralph had climbed on the first morning, then turned off to his right among the trees. He walked with an accustomed tread through the acres of fruit trees where the least energetic could find an easy, if unsatisfying, meal. Fruit and flower grew together on the same tree, and everywhere was the scent of ripeness and booming of a million bees at pasture. Here, the little ones who had run after him caught up with him. They talked and cried out unintelligibly, lugged him toward trees. Then amid a roar of bees in the afternoon sunlight, Simon found for them the fruit they could not reach, pulled off the choicest from up in the foliage, passed them back down to the endless outstretched hands. When he had satisfied them, he paused and looked around. The little ones watched him inscrutably over double handfuls of ripe fruit. 
So Simon is the one kid who, the one older boy who's nice to the little kids. And what's interesting here is, right, he's providing for them. We have a leader in Ralph. Ralph's not really providing. He's trying to build them huts, but he's not providing for them in the same way Simon is. And we know that the fact that the kids are going after him in particular, right? They're running after him. He's, he's a, a figure who the little kids run after and go to for help for things they need, right? And it's also really interesting, again, this visual image of the sunlight that comes, um, comes towards the trees mid the roar of bees in the afternoon sunlight. So there's this kind of a stream, I, I picture a stream of sunlight coming down on Simon and he's, he's handing these little kids nourishment, right? Um, I think it's also interesting, his a custom tread, clearly, he goes off by himself an awful lot, right? He's going through the forest a lot, right? Simon turned away from them and went, and went where the just perceptible path led him. Soon high jungle closed in, tall trunks bore unexpected pale flowers all the way up to the dark canopy where life went on clamorously. Here, the, the air here was dark too, and the creepers dropped their ropes like rigging foundered ships. His feet left prints in the soft soil, and the creepers shivered throughout their lengths when he bumped into them. He came at last to a place where more sunshine fell. Since they did not, had not so far to go for light, the creepers had woven a great map that hung at the side of an open space in the jungle. For here a patch of rock came close to the surface and would not allow for more than little plants and ferns to grow. The whole space was rolled with dark aromatic bushes and there was a bowl of heat and light. A great tree had fallen across one corner, leaning against the trees that stood, and a rapid climber flaunted red and yellow sprays up at the top. Again, in this in this section, I want you to really look at the descriptions of, we've got air that's dark. He describes the air as dark here, right? Um, the creepers shiver when Simon touches them, right? He's really personifying the forest and the jungle, right? How can air be dark? What does that mean? Is that a shadiness? Is that a feeling, a dampness within the air? Think about what that means to you, right? And really look at when Golding uses sunlight and when he uses darkness. Um, all right. Simon paused. He looked over his shoulder as Jack had done at the, at the closed ways behind him and he had glanced swiftly round to confirm that he was utterly alone. Okay, he's utterly alone. Well, I'm gonna, I have questions about that. Why does Simon want to be alone? Is it that he's hiding something? Does he have a bunch of food that people don't have? What are the reasons to be alone, right? For a moment, his moments, his movements were almost furtive. Then he bent down and wormed his way into the center of the map. So it seems to me he's looking, to, he, he's keeping this as his secret place, right? The creepers in the bushes were so close that he left his sweat on them, and they pulled together behind him. He was secure in the middle. He was in a little cabin screened off from the open space by a few leaves. He squatted down part of the leaves and looked out into the clearing. Nothing moved but a pair of, of gaudy butterflies that danced round each other in the hot air. Holding his breath, he cocked a critical ear at the sounds of the island. Evening was advancing towards the island. The sounds of the bright, fantastic birds, the bee sounds, even crying of gulls that were returning to their roosts among the square rocks were fainter. The deep sea breaking miles away on the reef made an undertone less perceptible than the susurration of the blood. 
I'm fascinated by this last sentence. I'm not exactly sure what I make of it. Okay, the deep sea breaking miles away on the reef made an undertone less perceptible. I'm pretty good up until there. Okay, I can imagine. I've been to the beach. I know what it sounds like, that could the waves breaking, and especially when you get a little bit farther away, how it just kind of has a whispering sound. Okay, then the susurration. Okay, susurration, that word means kind of the, the gentle waving, right, the, of blood, right? If you think about um, medical videos where you, you zoom in on what blood sounds like, kind of whooshing through veins or something like that, right? That's what he's talking about. And then, of the blood. What blood? Whose blood? Simon's blood? The blood of the pig? That they're that they're hunting the blood of all the boys what what are we talking about here um, but it's kind of interesting within this he, he seems like he's found this secret uh, peaceful place um, and you know then at the end we get this this word about blood blood denotes violence so maybe Another idea might be, right, when, when uh, people get angry, we sometimes say their blood boils, boils. So maybe him removing himself from the group, from the anger that Jack and, and Ralph are um, feeling for one another, from the, the endless fights, the endless problems, uh, the boiled blood, right? He, he's removing himself, trying to get to a peaceful place. But the deep sea breaking miles away that we've made an undertone less perceptible than this blood. So either he's very perceptive of his own, he really hears his own body working, or maybe he's thinking about the blood of the other boys. I don't know. I'm guessing here. This is things we might think about as we're reading. Simon dropped a screen of leaves back into place. The slope of the bars of the honey-colored sunlight decreased. They slid up the bushes, passed over the green candle-like buds, moved up toward the canopy, and darkness thickened under the trees. With the fading of the light, the riotous colors died, the heat and urgency cooled away, the candle buds stirred, their green sepals drew back a little, and the white tips of the flowers rose delicately to meet the open air. So here's another interesting part. Darkness is coming. Right? Night's coming. Night's falling. Evening's falling. But the perception here, we also have equals peace. It feels very peaceful. So as opposed to maybe some of the other boys, Simon is at peace with this dark, right? He's enjoying watching the dark come. Now the sunlight had lifted clear of the open space and withdrawn from the sky. Darkness poured out, submerging the ways between the trees till they were dim and strange as the bottom of the sea. The candle buds opened their wide white flowers, glimmering under the light that pricked down from the first stars. Their scent spilled out into the air and took possession of the island. This is lovely. Um, and I think what's one thing that's really important to note is um, could any other boy on this island notice something like this? I would argue no. Maybe you could find one. But I would argue this description even though it's telling us about the island, it's really telling us an awful lot about Simon.